Good morning to everyone. This is now Sabbath School, and our mission segment this morning is going to focus on our Montana mission, which we've just had a group return. You're looking at some of those who have gone. I think this is the younger half of the trip that's up here today. Uh, I was not there, so I wouldn't want to include myself in that. But uh, we've just seen another step go forward out in Montana, and we're getting close. We anticipate opening the church up sometime in the spring of next year, at least that's the hope. And uh, there's a lot of work. This building, when it's all said and done, will have uh, a value in excess of over a million dollars. The largest part of that uh, donated in labor, and the rest of it, of course, in uh, the funds of a variety of people in Michigan and Montana and a few other places. So let's pray and let's see what they got done and hear from uh, our missionaries. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the blessings of service, the joy it brings, the intrinsic reward. And I'm asking now, Lord, that you would do a beautiful work in our hearts and that you would nerve us to continue reaching out, in this case, to the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. So please guide us now as we get a report in regards to those efforts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. So uh, this was a very interesting trip for me personally because it first started out, we didn't have... um, a lot of men volunteers, and then we had a lot of young ladies volunteer, which uh, I was thinking, okay, well, how will this work? We only need so many people in the kitchen, but, uh, you know, they can work, they can paint, they can... but when it came to training them to use power tools, I was thinking, wow, this is going to be a, a, a very educational class, and uh, it was, it was kind of a little challenging to me because I'm thinking, okay, they're going to have to learn how to use a, a chop saw. They're going to have to learn how to use a table saw, a tile saw, and in a very short period of time, like in 30 minutes. <laughs> but I was amazed they did so well. And uh, they were very eager to learn. And this is a picture of our group right here. And uh, when we went out, it was extremely hot. But I thank God we had some air conditioning in the building. The first thing we had to do was unload a lot of material, uh, probably about five, 6,000 pounds of tile and thin set and some lumber. And so we formed a, uh, a chain and uh, we just made a little assembly line there and handed it off to each other. And half of it went upstairs and half of it went downstairs. So we had to do a little running up and down the stairs, but it was... It was good for us all. So what building are we looking at? So this is the northeast door going into the facility at the Fort Peckinian Reservation near the church that we're building. It's going to serve as a community center as well. This door enters in, and to the left of that entry, there's an apartment, and you'll see some uh, work going on there in a moment. To the left of that door is the upward upstairs kitchen, I mean. And then as you go in, just to the left or to the right a little bit is some stairs going downstairs as well. It looks like it has a curved roof and painted blue. I didn't even recognize it. Yeah, so we got some, uh, the base coat some, for some stucco work on the facility right now. So it looks a lot different than it did before. Right. And so that's good. So we'd have our morning and evening worships and uh, there was always, God always provided something from his word to uh, strengthen us for the day. And this is in the college dormitory. Yes. So this, was, this is actually the last time that we would stay in this dormitory now. The facility is up to the point where now we can stay there. And uh, you'll see as we go through the pictures, uh, a lot more was done on the outside as well. And the relationship with the college became so close that they actually just gave you a key. That's right. So you carried a key around for this dormitory <laughs> right back here in Michigan. Yes. And that's it, a beautiful thing because it was a strained relationship probably 10 years ago. Right, right. And so now it's a very strong relationship. And uh, so that everybody knows uh, the Stevensville Church, our church, and the the, uh, Native American uh, leader of the the unit out there, the union out there, Steve Huey, we all pitched in and we bought them a brand new cook stop uh, glass top stove um, as a a contribution to the college uh, because they They've always been very kind to us and generous, and whenever we needed to stay there, they were willing to say, you know what, let's do it, we'll get it ready, and you can be there. So that was a blessing. 
So I do want to go around here. Uh, here's, uh, I'm giving a little class on cutting tile. So uh, I'd like to hear from the panel here, what was your experience? Uh, what did you enjoy most about the trip? We'll start with Leela here. Laura Lee, I mean, I always call you Leela. Laura Lee, what was it that you enjoyed the most about this trip? Well, I found it to be very refreshing. Uh, it was lots and lots of um, good work, good hard work, and I enjoy work. But um, getting to know other mission-minded people was definitely a blessing, and being able to be engaged together in service, um, it was very refreshing. Um, I really just enjoy learning how to do the new things. Um, I was kind of like, why am I going on this trip if I don't know how to do any of this? But it was really cool learning how to lay the tile, how to use all the power tools, and then also just getting to know everyone, making new friends. It was really a blessing. Well, being the oldest one in the building crew, <laughs> it was a really hard experience. But um, learning how to use a tape measure was a hard task for me. And um, it was a, such a bless that these young ladies had the patience with me to teach me. And I was asking and asking, and every time they were so patient. So. Thank you, and I thank the Lord that they sent, he sent me with this group. Amen. This would probably be by far the, uh, the youngest group as far as young adults to gather together and go out and work on this uh, project. So um, I appreciate everybody's eagerness to learn. Uh, Mike Jacobson came along, and he was very helpful. Uh, because when I was downstairs, he was upstairs. So he was working with them, helping them out while I was downstairs working with another team. And what we did is uh, we broke off into pairs. And I tried to get everybody to just pair off and work in different parts of the uh, room and uh, so that you could create a, a nice atmosphere of fun and joy as well as uh, get project moving along. And so it went very well, as you'll see here, uh, learning how to use the chop saw. Now, if you've never used the chop saw before, it can be kind of scary. And uh, let me ask you, were, were you a little timid at first? Or tell me about your experience, Yvette, when you first grabbed that chop saw and you went to cut that board or that piece of flooring. Um, I think I just didn't want to lose any fingers when I was doing it. So just really running through the instructions you gave, just making sure like step by step I was doing what you said so that um, it went well, so yeah. yeah. We're, we're very adamant about keeping all our fingers, especially our thumbs. So Martin, tell us a little bit about your experience on this trip. Well, um, <clears throat> it was really enjoyable for me because I, had a, I was able to work with people my age. Usually, when I go on this Mon these Montana trips, it's uh, people much older than me or much younger than me, and I don't have people my age to really converse with and, and uh, talk, on, talk about things that are relative to our age, I guess, um, but um, sanctified things, of course. But um, it, was, it, was, it was very enjoyable for me, and I was able to get to know each of these individuals, ladies, much more, and um, I really enjoyed the uh, spiritual atmosphere, the worships that we had, um, by far the best worships that I've had on, on these mission trips. And uh, thank you for all that you had shared as well during the worships. Amen. Amen. So um, here we got the working on the table saw. This is uh, Claudia and again measuring and uh, Yvette uh, helping her out with uh, the tape measure there. This is uh, one of the classrooms that we're putting flooring down in and it was a vinyl lock together, and it went very well. We got a little video here coming up. Oh, did we move it out? Next one here coming up. Well, this is the lady celebrating. Erin Penrod went with us on this trip, and she was a great worker as well. 
so we did some tile, we did some vinyl flooring, and here's Yoshi. Yoshi, was this the first time you've done tile work? Yes, I've never done tile work before, and um, it, it was interesting, it was good to learn. I'm sure it'll be useful later on, too, so thank you. Amen. So Yoshi has decided to take a year off of his uh, vocation and join us and uh, learn more about pastoral ministry and leadership. And so on this trip, he had an opportunity to learn some of those skills in leading as he would work together with a team and I would give him certain uh, tasks to do that would require him to not only learn, but then to teach somebody else as well. So it went very well. I appreciate your, your eagerness to, to move forward on that. And uh, downstairs, there's two bathrooms in this facility that have three showers and a couple uh, uh, toilets in each one. And so we're getting that all done. This one bathroom is now complete, ready for usage. It does need a sink, and that would be the only thing that we need to do in there. And now the other one's also being done. So here we have some flooring going in in the kitchen upstairs. And uh, it started out with a couple of us working in there, and then every, I think everybody had a chance to work in the kitchen upstairs. So that was a really uh, great opportunity for learning how to do tile. Uh, Mike Jacobson here, uh, he, he, he did everything from mixing tile, cutting tile, to helping hand out materials, to uh, sharing with each other how to get things done. Here's a little video on the flooring. I, I told these young ladies, if, if you were a contractor and you went in to bid this job, this floor here was large enough, it'd probably bid add up about $1,000 to lay that flooring. And so uh, when they got it all done, they were like, wow, you know, that was amazing. You can make good money doing this. So I don't know if any of them's gonna shift careers or after they've done this or not, but uh, it was a real blessing to see them work hard and get it done. They did a great job. Here's the apartment, they worked together there. Now the apartment was a little more challenging. Uh, Laura Lee, you worked in there. What was some of the things that you, you learned as you were laying that flooring in that room? Well, uh, in the apartment there was, um, the wall jogged a lot more, so you had to um, be, be more careful with making the measurements and cutting and things like that. Um, but it, yeah, it was, it was definitely um, a great experience working together and um, forming a team, just working, working in pairs was really good. So going into the other room, when you, when you go and you have to jog over and then you go into another room, uh, sometimes you have to start going back in the other direction, so that could be a little challenging. So it really makes you think a little more about your cuts and uh, how to, how to um, address the challenges you face going back and into a closet or around a corner. So um, I had the opportunity of working with Yoshi on the tile uh, here in the kitchen, and I'm an independent worker. I've, I've used, I've, a lot of my life, I've worked by myself doing projects and stuff. So working with another person can kind of complicate things for me, if you, you kind of understand that. I get a little frustrated. Uh, people, people just don't, they, for some reason, they just can't understand what I'm thinking about, you know, without me telling them. It's just, it, I don't understand that. So communication is, is something I learned, and um, working in pairs and groups with others and uh, it's, it's something that the Lord's still helping me with, but on this trip, it really came out and was developed much more. It was interesting. As we went out, we stayed at the North Dakota Academy, and uh, uh, the morning worship revolved around character building, and, I, and I, I made sure everybody understood that this trip was definitely going to be a character building trip for everybody, and I said, but me, but I was just kidding because I knew it was going to be a big character building trip for me because, you know, when you're work, used to working with a lot of skilled people, uh, you can just say, I need you to do this, and then you can walk away and go on to the next project and say, I need you to do this. But, you know, it was important for me to be patient and take time to, to go through all the steps. And I'm glad I did the seventh grade class uh, building class because it, it taught me to, to slow down 
and make sure I go over each step patiently because it's very important. When you know that you've been taught the right way, uh, it makes it easier to grasp and move forward. You can do it with more confidence. And so it was definitely a blessing for us all to gather together. Now, I want to tell you that after we worked each day, uh, Myrna Witzel and B.J. Miller had a wonderful meal for us. They worked hard every day to make sure we ate well. And I really appreciate their labor contribution. And they would come over and they'd check out how things were going. And uh, it was great. We worked late uh, every evening and uh, nobody complained about that. And uh, then we did go over and we did get a, a refreshing ice cream one evening to celebrate the victory of the accomplished work. So each day we had a task to do and everybody met it and uh, rejoiced to do it. And then we went out to the Badlands. Now I'd like somebody to share your experience on the Badlands. How'd you just like it? They're shaking their head. Well, what did you like about it? I enjoy being in nature and um, in the less traveled parts of nature. So it was interesting to go out there and see um, just a different part of the country and um, some of the, the land out there. Man. You know, it's definitely called the Badlands for a reason. It's hot. When we went out there, it was close to 100 degrees. And so I told everyone, make sure you have enough water and uh, you're, you're ready to come back if you got overexerted. So these are just the final pictures. Now, when we left, another group, Elder Merlin Knowles, which was the uh, former conference president, a couple presidents back, of the Michigan Con or Montana Conference, he gathered together about 40 people and they came out and they formed up all the uh, areas that would need concrete and they, they got that poured and they got some RV uh, sewage lines run and that was completed as well. As soon as we left, they came in the next day and it was great to see that progressing on. Now, we, friends, we are getting close to getting this facility wrapped up. So. Not only will there be places to stay in the building, but there'll be hookups for two or three RVs outside the yes. building. So it makes arriving there and housing a number of people very convenient. Yes, it does. You know, we have uh, actually five electrical hookups for RVs, and uh, we have the three drain lines there for sewage, and we have an outside water supply. So um, it, if you want to come out and you don't want to stay in the building, you want to stay in your RV, just bring your RV out. You can go on out to Glacier National Park and you can do a little vacationing with the family, but you can stop by and be a part of the mission project as well. And so they not only did the work, which we can see the seamen in now, which is fantastic addition, but they were also raising funds to cover that side. That's right. Thank you for the reminder on that. You know, different groups that have come out these last several times, the Stevensville Church, a church over in Williston, uh, North Dakota, and uh, uh, Elder Knowles' group, they've been raising the money to do their part of the work. Uh, Pastor Joe Reeves, when he came out with his church, they raised money to do what they wanted to accomplish on that church. And so that's been a real blessing for the conference as well as the people there on the reservation. And there might be somebody watching online that wants to contribute to some part of the finishing of the work and so they can get a hold of us at the church office and be directed to you and see this thing through to a finish. Amen, that would be great. Uh, and so if you are interested in it, you're watching online either now or you watch later, that's true, Pastor Kelly. They can go online to our online giving and they can check the Montana Project or uh, evangelism and just make a note and we'll make sure that gets to the proper area there. And we're getting close to getting this done. So we are going to have another group going out in October. And so if you'd like to be a part of that group, let me know. It's going to be either the, uh, the 11th or 12th. It's a Monday or Tuesday we're going to head out. And uh, then the following, we'll be out there for a week and we'll be back the following Monday or Tuesday. So if you'd like to be a part of that, let me know. And we'll get you signed up. And... Uh, know that it doesn't matter if you know how to do the work or not. These ladies can tell you, you, you can learn, and it would be a blessing. And they genuinely, he spoke of how hard they worked over and over again. So Yes, it was great. So 
The other thing they did do mm -hmm. is they got an overhead door uh, put in. This, this covers an uh, opening that goes into the, the sanctuary that will also be used as a uh, all-purpose room, and that's the kitchen where they're standing right now. So they got that put in, and that was something they raised money for as well. So um, it seems like we do a lot of just work, uh, at least from the presentation, just work and just worship to ourselves. But every time we go out, we try to make it a, a goal that we can go into the community or at least outreach whenever we uh, go places within the community. So um, we went to get ice cream twice. And um, when we go, uh, we'd, we'd adamantly hand out books and uh, share with people, try to talk to those that are either working in the ice cream shop or that are around the ice cream shop, that are in the ice cream shop and uh, give them some literature or just try to talk with them, connect with them. And um, I felt impressed to talk to the cashier after we had uh, bought our ice cream. And I had this book, um, Real Peace, Real Answers, I think is what it's called, it has Steps to Christ in the first part and then some Bible answers uh, in the latter portion. And I, I felt impressed to, to ask her, do you know that Jesus loves you? And she looked at me and she said, no, I don't. And that really just just broke me and she said that few, recently her mother had passed away and that she was really struggling and that the book would be a blessing to her and encouragement so praising the Lord for interactions like that they we could be a blessing to them but they're really a blessing to us and they really they open our heart up amen. to ministry and to outreach amen. amen the average age on the reservation the average life expectancy mm -hmm. is 51 and uh, we are planning to take our 8th graders out there for a week of mission, and if all things get a proper approvals, they'll then take their class trip on the back side of that and see some things that yours truly didn't see till he was a middle-aged person. So uh, this is to, designed to be a place for our, our uh, students, whether they're in the PA program at Union or the PT program at Andrews or wherever they are, to have a low-cost, high-impact experience. And because we have so many showers and uh, toilets in the basement and two kitchens in this building, etc., this is a place where, without spending an arm and a leg, we can engage a broken world and make a difference. So when our eighth graders, if it works out, are out there preaching and teaching things of health and engaging in the appropriate places, including the juvenile detention center, not only are they going to see where sin leads, but they're going to be a leading uh, hand and voice out of bondage and degradation. So I can't tell you how uh, exciting it is for me to see this coming to fruition. Now, there are a lot of things to work out, and I'd like the church to be praying because there's not a lot of people to inhabit this building. And the oversight and the direction, the mission, uh, the use of the building, etc., we need... Uh, to, to continue to go forward in faith. We have a great relationship with uh, the different people we've worked with, but there's been some turnover in the Montana Conference, and uh, we're off to a good start with those individuals that are leading out there. So we're asking you to pray. It was a wonderful trip. Uh, it kind of came together in a unique way, and the lives of our youth dedicated in service will be the most fulfilling and the most impactful. So thank you, all of you that went on that trip. And by God's grace, there'll be many others as we go forward. And with the Lord's help, we'll see fruit from our labors. And it may not be now. It may be farther down the road. And it may be in eternity. But God's word goes out. Every seed is fertile. And if it's tended to, it will grow. So friends, let's, let's keep praying for the project. And uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our young people going out and I believe we have a trip planned in uh, May, latter part of April, May, uh, to take our, our eighth graders, seventh, eighth graders out there. Just eighth graders. Just eighth graders, and they're gonna have a wonderful experience. So our project, our goal is to have that project complete or very close to being complete by then. So again, if you wanna be a part of it, come and see us. Thank you. All right, God bless you all. We'll transition now to our lesson. So we'd like to invite the panelists for our Sabbath School lesson to come up and join us. Thank you, missionaries. God bless you.
Okay, it's hard to imagine we're moving on through the month of August. Just this is our last Sabbath. Our Sabbath school lesson is Rest in Christ. And as school has started, it will probably not take too long to get to the end of the month of September as well. So let's look at this week's lesson. Rhythms of Rest. Rhythms of Rest. We'll ask the Lord to bless our study, and then we'll let the panelists introduce themselves, and we'll jump into our study this morning. All right, I'm going to ask if, uh, Diana, if you'll have prayer for us as we start. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather to study your word, I pray that your spirit teach us and open our hearts and our minds to understand that which you want to communicate with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, I think we'll start down here at this end with Merlin. Give us a little introduction to who you are. Maybe you and Diane will have to share. Yeah, it's on. All right. Oops. Oh, that's good. Mervyn Gatchaw, student at seminary. All right. I'm Diana Ramoni. I am a student at the seminary as well. I'm Erling Snorason a fairly recent member of this good church here. And also in and out of retirement, serving as the interim president of different ones of our conferences. Pastor Dennis Page, assistant pastor here at Village. And my name is Jeanette Snorrison, and um, I am a retired and a member of this church also. And married to the man on my right. So, very good. Let's jump into our lesson here. Rhythms of Rest. Memory text, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Paragraph, begin the lesson, says, Who can imagine when the acts of creation, light amid darkness, oceans brimming with life, birds suddenly taking flight, must have been like, and the supernatural creation of Adam and Eve? We can't even begin to grasp how God did it. But then, after all this act of creating, God turned his attention to something else. At first glance, it did not seem as spectacular as leaping whales or dazzling feather displays. God simply made a day, the seventh day, and then he made it special. Even before humanity would dash off to our self-imposed stressful lives, God set a marker as a living memory aid. God wanted this day to be a time for us to stop and deliberately enjoy life, a day to be and not do, to celebrate the gift of grass, air, wildlife, water, people, and most of all, the creator of every good gift. The invitation would continue even after the first couple was exiled from Eden. God wanted to make sure that the invitation could stand the test of time. And so right from the beginning, he knit it to the very fabric of time itself. During this week, we will study God's wonderful invitation to enter into a dynamic rest again and again with every seventh day. All right, we go to Sunday's lesson, the preludes to rest. Uh, the first question is, what did God's evaluation indicate about creation? We've got 31 verses there. What's a decent summary of that, Pastor Page? Well, it, it summed up as good, very good. Okay, good you and know, very good. And and when you look at it, it's amazing. God took very careful care to make sure that everything was prepared the day before to support the life that would be created the following day. He left nothing undone that was necessary for the happiness of all created beings and all creatures. And that just marvels me to think that he took every detail into consideration Prior to creating a bird, he, cre he took in consideration where it would have to nest, the environment it would need to thrive in, uh, the blessings that could be uh, created to, to bless that little bird. And uh, he put that all into, into to plan and, and, and just brought it all to fruition. It's just amazing. I just sit back and when I look at the trees and the flowers and uh, not long ago, I was climbing a, a hill, and I, this, those little flowers that come out in the early spring, I don't know what they call them, but they're real little, but you've got to really take time to stop and look at them. And God was thinking about us when he was creating that little flower, and that's just amazing. Amen. Anybody else? Summary. One thing, one thing that I think is really 
Is this on? Yeah. One thing that I think is very interesting, um, in the first chapter alone, the name of God or the Godhead is mentioned 44 times. I counted them. There's 44 times God wanted us to realize and to remember that he did it. His, either his spirit, it said he or I or God, 44 different times. Wow, so no accident, no wondering, unless of course you doubt the biblical record. As Pastor Page was speaking, I was thinking of the way God works is very different from the way man works. Um, for example, if we were to build something, we'd first think, uh, well, let's hire you know, the crew to do this, right? But God didn't need a crew to create the earth, right? He had his own powers to do it. So therefore, everything that was created up until man was created was a gift. We didn't have to work for it. So here from the very beginning, God showered us with his goodness. And so that is something. And not only that, there is a rhythm. It's always interesting when I read this Genesis 1, you know, it's like in and, and a story of creation because it seems that there is a rhythm. After he created this, he looked, everything was good. Created every, it was night and evening and then morning. It was the first day, evening, morning. And that rhythm continues today. And so we accept that there is a daily rhythm, right? Do we also then should accept that there is a weekly rhythm that God wants? Even in that weekly rhythm, there is rest for us, the rest at night, but there's a special rest on the seventh day. Amen. Very beautiful thoughts. And of course, when you walk into a beautiful place, whether it's a home or a park, if you realize it was made specifically for you, it can be overwhelming. And uh, to stop and think about that kind of goodness would really cause us to love God even more. Mervyn? Uh, you know, on my journey trying to figure out life, right, uh, not having any special uh, religious upbringing, so I had to figure things out by myself. So things were more in the practical, and then I needed something else, and this is where, cut the story short, I discovered the Bible. And when I read it, it did speak to me, I said, wow. I have a creator. So the most amazing thing about creation is we have a creator. We are not a product of Azad, not Big Ben, evolution, all these. We have a creator. And once you get a glimpse and understanding that you were created by God, it makes a lot of difference in this world. <laughs> the, the ultimate and consummate difference. All right? Yeah. And I would just like to add to that, you know, and it comes out in this second question here. The difference between God creating uh, all the uh, plants and animals in that and then creating man, he, he stops speaking and he begins to work with his hands, hands on. And he forms man and then he breathes into his nostrils, gives him the breath of life. When man opens his eyes, the first thing he sees is the face of God. And uh, I can't wait to see Adam and talk to him and ask him, what was that like? And you know, the, t the intimate care in which God took to create man tells us that we were created for a personal, intimate relationship with him. And it's interesting, when we were talking about this the other day in a committee room, and uh, you said how God, you know, put his hand and formed him. It made me think about the studies that have been done that an infant, if it doesn't have that tender touch and care, it will actually die or just grow up very rough and hard. Mm -hmm. Failure and to thrive. So God created us to experience that sense of touch and care because he, that's how he created humanity. To the floor. We're often... Um, prone to hyperbole, you know, if we kept a fish this big, it becomes that big. And yet God, uh, you know, when he creates everything perfect, he calls it good and very good. And, and we know that it was a perfect creation. So it, it's just amazing to see his love and care in that. And I love the fact that even though we know we, we are in a faith journey, um, and as Adventist Christians, we have things that we believe that, that are unique and distinct. I love it when he confirms those things. I was reading an article 
in uh, Adventist Journey this week, and I shared it with the teachers, and it's about coping and resiliency. And the article brings out the, that, the point that God not, doesn't only want us to cope, but he wants us to be resilient. And the difference is somebody who, it's a difference between somebody who's thriving and somebody who's just existing. So what this uh, uh, author brought out was that the Sabbath and the sanctuary are two things that are really important in that, co in that uh, resiliency. And the Sabbath actually gives us that re restorative rest where we can deal with the stresses and strains of life and all the challenges we find and be more than conquerors. So I just love it when God, you know, he says, come now, let us reason together. Um, though your sins are as scarlet, you'll be white as snow. He, he doesn't just say, oh, follow me blindly, as we're, you know, sometimes accused of doing. Um, he says, come let us reason together. And then he gives you those, he throws you to those things like that article that show that as Adventists, we are firm and strong in our faith because we believe things that, uh, they're not just doctrines, they have an impact on our lives. Yeah, I'm looking this article up while you're talking because um, the author of a new book, was this a woman author by chance, a Dr. Rhonda? Um, she contacted me this last week in regards to her new book. And uh, it, it, the messaging that is out there is exactly where a faith-based group of people need to be. It's, it's not go to the caves like Saul and his men did, but it's like Jonathan, go out and conquer in the name of the Lord. And in her book, what she describes, if this is the same author, is that the centenarians that live there around Loma Linda have gone through some of the hardest things anybody's ever gone through in their lives. And instead of shorting their lives, the mentalities they had and brought to life from those things have made them overcomers. And they are experiencing a great degree of, of hope and strength in the midst of some of these challenges we're in. Very good thoughts. Thank you. All right, let's, I, do, I don't want to pass up mon, uh, Sunday's lesson, though. The difference about the creation of humanity from the rest of the world. So let's talk about those differences. For some reason, there is a distinct difference when we get to the creation of man and woman. There's a thought that I've always thought, uh, pondered. Why is it that God made man, men, out of the dust he formed man out of the dust, and he brew, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then he formed women out of bone. And I've often wondered, why is that? Why did God make men of dust and women of bone? Is it because he knew that men needed more support from someone that was made of bone? I don't know. It's just a thought. Probably I've often true. Wondered, you know. Why, Do you why want to add this? anything to that? Yeah, I would say the bone is more enduring than the dust. Oh, that's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> and the marriage is retained. All right. Other thoughts? Anybody from the floor or the panel? What, what are the uniquenesses of this, this change? -up? Very good thoughts. Hadn't thought about it like that before. You know, uh, when you look at how God created the woman from the side of Adam. Uh, first, he had to let Adam long for a companion and, and realize that he needed something more than just the creation before him. He, he longed for somebody to be his companion. So God created the longing in his heart, and then he would let him sleep, and he would create the woman from his side, from his rib, to, to teach us all that, you know, there's, there's a unity that God ordained to take place between humanity. We're to be closely knit together, whether it's in a marriage, a family, a church, a community. God ordained that we'd be closely knit together. So humanity, at differing degrees, was designed for closeness. Yes. Yeah, I see that. People, people long for that connection. Mervyn? So all the other days, things were good and then it was very good. So that's an amazing statement from God because, you know, we are living in a world where everything is, you're quantified based on many stuff like your degrees, your job, and everything. But now we see a statement that God, when he created Adam and Eve, 
first human beings on earth, it was very good. So is it after sin we are losing the concept of very good? No, God is the same. He doesn't change. So this implies that even in this world, you might be left apart, but guess what? You have a very good creation of God. You still have value, right? And I think it gives another dimension to people who are struggling in this earth, you know, to find their identity and their self-esteem. Well, you can develop a God esteem because you're a child of God. You know, uh, you can almost sense, um, I, I, as I'm listening to you describe that, um, is God even a little bit surprised at how good this is? I mean, what's the difference between good and very good? It, it's certainly an expression that captures something worth thinking about. And uh, the idea also that God is a very good redeemer and he can make us, it's not just that he's restoring us to our original position. His redemptive power is so, so good that we'll live in his house, sit on his throne, and govern the universe with him. So uh, what the devil sought to mess up was the instrumentality for God making something even better. And it, it really kind of obligates us. You know, I think when Martin was up here uh, telling the story about giving out the steps of Christ to the lady at the ice cream shop, you couldn't see down there on the ground, but he was, he was touched. Uh, me sitting right next to him, I could see the tears in his eye. <laughs> if people don't know, they're very good, and there's a very good future. Going to a Christless grave isn't about losing salvation. It's about not experiencing it as soon as possible. Just want to add something quickly. I, I, I paint, okay? The amazing thing when you paint, if I paint a beggar, how many of you think that the beggar has a lot of value? Worldly speaking, no. people don't think that, right? You take the same beggar you put in a painting, it has loads of value, right? But guess what? When you take the same beggar, and you put in front of God, it has a lot of value. So we all have value. Only understood in the relationship with God. Yes, I was thinking of um, how long it took to create the crowning act of creation. One day, the sixth day. But God spent five days in preparing for that crowning act. And uh, so I look on those five days as a preparation. Um, it reminds me of John 14, verse 2. I go away to prepare a place for you. And God will do that again. Um, he's doing it right now. He's preparing a place for the redeemed mankind. And I bet it's going to be very good. Oh, yes. A new heaven and a new earth. Wow. To think that the original garden will be there. And yet, you must have a sense that in the effort put forward to create, there was a definite, I don't think the word exertion is right necessarily, but let's use the word exertion. So an exertion of heaven to create, but the exertion of heaven to redeem is infinitely beyond. Okay, we'll go to the floor. The uh, one concept of creation is something for us to understand. It is the extension of God's love. So each item of creation is a further extension of God's love. And so when woman was created, it was not anything to do with man or the or the substance that woman was put together by, it was an extension of God's love. That this is the completion of his wonderful creation works. What a beautiful way. Yep, on the floor back there, if you don't mind, James. And then over to this side. Okay, we'll, we'll give the microphone a chance to go there because we're about to switch gears over to a new day. So, okay, we'll go over here. I would just like to point out that the difference between good and very good in God's pronouncement of creation is that which he had created and declared was good operated in obedience to laws according to instinct and not free will. 
So when he created Adam and Eve, there was a distinct difference between them and the rest of creation in that Adam and Eve were free moral agents and the only ones of creation that were such. Yeah, very good point. And then over here on the middle aisle, James, if you don't mind. Yeah, there is, I mean, the very first few verses of the Bible are resplendent with opportunity to reflect. Uh, one of the things that just catches me right here is the difference between good and very good. Uh, Moses kind of writes this in a, in a typical Hebrew chiastic structure in that he gives you the crux and then he basically leads up to what made things good and very good. We see that Adam was created and then basically God makes all these animals come up before him and he's able to name them. Adam sees that these animals have mates and he doesn't. As a point of this, he goes on to say in, um, in verse 20, it says, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help me for him. And the Lord caused it. And wait a minute, where do I want to see this here? Um, in verse 18, it says, And the Lord said, It is not good. So in midst of all of these things being good, 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 God declares it's not good. And so God has to fix this. And that's when he actually installs the ability for man to have a relationship. At that point, he now makes a woman. The combination of the man who knows that he needs the woman and the woman who was brought before the man now makes this whole experience very good. Without that relationship type aspect of it, man could have been able to be created perfect in the image of God, but it wouldn't have been actually really perfect in the image of God until he understood relationship. Once he understands relationship, then he could go to the Sabbath day and he can actually keep the Sabbath because he knows how to keep relationship. So the bone is the enduring part of this relationship because Adam knows that he needs this. Eve knows that she needs it by default now as well. And the two of them together with relationship now form a bond ready to go and meet the God who created them and now it becomes very good as a result of that. But before that the creation of Adam was not good. The creation of Adam and Eve together with perfect relationship was very good. Amen. And it makes me think as I'm listening to you talk that all the work we put into relationships is very good too. And uh, the laws of God govern those but, of course, people who have lived longer than us with those laws can give us understanding that can shorten the cycle of learning by trial and error, which makes the family in its generations very good, which makes the church in a society where there's a lot of separation and breakdown very good. So these relational things are very important. Okay, this will be our last comment on this day, and then we're going to move on. If he had made Eve of the dust, they would have been separate entities. But this was the first marriage to be, and they were tied physically. So there's no independence, total independence. They're tied together. Okay, and very good thought. And when you put God into that picture as the third cord that can't easily be broken, uh, you start seeing the highest order of relational joy, especially as we transition out of a perfect garden into a broken world. Okay? All right. Let's, let's move on to the next day, the command to rest. All right? So creation was very good, but it was not yet complete. Creation ended with God's rest and a special blessing of the seventh day Sabbath. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So, you know, the Sabbath did not exist before the garden. Sabbath rest in Christ existed but the actual Sabbath was created in the garden. In Exodus 20, 8 to 11, it says, what does this teach us about the importance of the Sabbath as it relates to creation? So what, what uh, God is reminding, the little sentence above says, many years later, when God freed his children from slavery in Egypt, he reminded them again of this special day. And so in that reminding, what are we learning about the importance of Sabbath as it relates to creation. Anybody? Well, looking at the commandment, um, I've looked at it and I, and I break it down. And, you know, God first looks at family, you, your son, your daughter. And he's very interested in making sure that we connect as family. 
He makes sure that we understand that those that would work for us, they need to rest too. Even if they don't understand the Sabbath commandment, we're to be a witness to them in giving them that opportunity. Even if they are not free thinking, even if they are the animals. That's right. And he goes on to even mention the animals. And so it's interesting to me that it's then he mentions the stranger that is within your gates after the animals. Why didn't he mention the stranger that is within your gates before the animals? Why didn't he put that first? Why didn't he mention the animals last? I think he's trying to get us to think about something here. That as the people that know this truth, if we were to go and cause a stranger to work for us while our animal is resting, what are we saying about that stranger compared to our own animal? They're not even as value in our own eyes as our own animal. They have lesser value to us. And, you know, the Jews, the Israelite nation, had done that at times. They'd allow their animals to rest, but they'd make their, the stranger work. And they would write it off as, well, he, he doesn't serve our God. But God put it in here that the, every, but every bit of creation here, his created beings, his animals, everything, was to enjoy that time of rest. So connection with God is blessing. Even if you are an animal and you don't have volition. Diana? I think it also shows us that, you know, uh, it is a memorial um, daily. It's that rhythm, the weekly rhythm that reminds us that God is the creator. Yeah, it's and not a chance. God, it's not a chance. And God rested, blessed, and sanctified it, right? Now, he didn't sanctify any other day. He didn't bless any other day, although all the other days were good, right? What he created on all That's the other true. days were good. But this particular day, the seventh day, he rested, blessed, and sanctified it. And he wants to give us that same blessing, the blessing of rest, the blessing of connecting with him. You know, this, the overarching text that keeps reminding me is Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And if I ever think, well, that's kind of like high in the sky, you know, kind of, you know, promise, right? This Sabbath is a physical rest, and God is inviting us to say, hey, come to me. Make this day a day that, you know, you're busy all the other days, but make this one day the day that you can truly, truly rest in me. And remember, it is not only just rest, but it's also a time of sacred assembly, as it's said in Leviticus, right? So relationship. If you're, it's a relationship. I mean, I think of my own home, right? I mean, our real life, right? We're so busy during the week with different things. But on Sabbath, Sabbath from my home, I guard it because it's the day that my kids and I have grown boys. One is 23 and the other one is 30. But it's the day they can come home and we can sit down and we have meal together and we catch up on the rest of the week and their lives and what's going on. So it's a day that we connect with each other and also it's a day dedicated to celebrating God. Amen. If you know him, you can celebrate him. If you don't know him, you're an accident. You have to take care of yourself and you don't get the privilege of being relegated rest. Okay, we'll go here and then here. I would like to praise God because the first church that I came was the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I didn't have much understanding about the Sabbath, why I was in the Seventh-day, but I just knew that I was led there unknowingly, then knowingly while reading the Word of God. And you weren't raised a Christian. No, I come from a Hindu background, all right? So <clears throat> when I started reading in the Sabbath, it's, it's like, wow. So, you know, when you do a painting, you need to sign, right? It's important to do that. This is where you contemplate and say, done, right? And now I get a sense of my identity that I have a creator, and now he's giving me rest. Why shouldn't I take the rest that he's giving me just to show him, to demonstrate that, hey, I'm your child, I have an identity. So now we have a comparison. Those who are resisting God and refusing the rest that he's giving, it's so good to get rest. He's giving you rest, and you don't need to feel guilty about taking a day off from your mundane activities. But when we rebel against God and say, hey, I don't want to do your Sabbath, you know what you're saying? I prefer slavery. I like my life as a slave. 
I want to be working seven days and killing myself, getting all these dollars, and then you get an economic crash, the value goes down, and then you lose everything. But at least when you celebrate the Sabbath, you still have an identity, the identity that will remain eternally. Money can buy it, so why not take the rest of God? This is our opportunity to live it, help people experience it. Yes, I came across a beautiful statement uh, from the book, Our High Calling, uh, that the Creator gave to man as a day upon which to rest and reflect upon sacred things. God designed the Sabbath to be observed through every age as a perpetual covenant. It was to be regarded as a peculiar treasure, a trust to be carefully cherished. And it is a treasure, isn't it? It is. Yes. And you know, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I can remember going to the pastor's house when I was a teenager. And uh, my home wasn't celebrating the Sabbath, but boy, the peace in that home and the pleasure of that fellowship, nobody had to convince me. It's like, this is good. You know, uh, similar, I didn't grow up in a religious or any type of faith-based uh, uh, group, but uh, coming out of the heathenism, you could say, and discovering the Bible Sabbath, that was delightful to know, wow, there's actually a day God created and set aside just for me. And when I was reading in Isaiah 58, um, it talks, it gives us some counsel here about turning away our foot from the Sabbath, from doing our own pleasure. And uh, on my holy day, he says, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him. We honor him by doing, not doing our own ways, nor finding our own pleasure, nor speaking our own words. But he pronounces a, a, an amazing blessing attached to the Sabbath day. And it tells us right here in verse 14, then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will, all right? And when he was delivering Israel out of Egypt seven times, he tells them, I will do something for you. And here he says, I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. And then the prophet emphasizes here, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so just like when God spoke and everything came into existence, all the, all the created plants and animals and stars and moon and sun, the prophet is telling us through inspiration, through the Spirit moving on him, make sure that people understand in keeping this day, there's creative power being given to you to rejuvenate, refresh, and restore you to move into the next week. Hmm. Wow, that sounds potent for all kinds of things from the creative person to the managerial and administrative person to leadership, and uh, who wouldn't want that? Um, the um, commandment says here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I found a statement here in the book Desire of Ages. It says, in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Now, I've pondered that a lot. How do we do that? How do we uh, keep the Sabbath holy when we ourselves are maybe not holy? How do we become holy? The answer probably is, says through faith, they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. Well, this is a whole big statement. This is a huge, huge order. How do we do this? Some well, thoughts. Oh, very, uh, and we're back to relationship again. So we're... We're, we've come completely full circle in some sense with that question because there is no natural goodness in us, but the remaking of the carnal appetites is important. If I'm used to watching cartoons like I was every Saturday morning and Friday night TV every Friday night, that first Friday night I was in my basement room. All I had was one of those cheap vinyl accordion doors that separated my room from the family room wasn't a very nicely finished basement, but that's where the family room was. And I'll tell you, that first Friday night, I wanted to go out and watch. And by God's grace, I had learned how to pray, and I resisted that temptation. Next Friday night, it wasn't quite so hard. 
and the rest that he began putting in my heart, the joy of communion with him. These are gifts. As long as we fertilize a love for the world, we will not be able to enter into that rest. Now, the invitation is to come to Jesus. He gives us rest on the inside, and he begins the transformation, and we keep that rest in a relationship with him. All right, we're coming down to the end. Any closing thoughts? Mervyn, you want to share something? You know, we lost the very good context of the sin, right? But guess what? We got the very good again. When? On the cross. Jesus brought the very good again, and he rested on Sabbath, right? So now we have a model of very good again for us to follow. We can't say we don't have a role model. Jesus set the tone, and if we follow his step, we are looking forward for the very good until the second coming of Christ, and we'll be leaving the very good again. In a world that is full of trouble, uh, full of all kinds of things that keep us busy throughout the week, God's Sabbath is a gift to each one of us. And we choose to either accept the gift of rest or we don't. But if we choose to accept the gift of rest, not only can we be physically at rest with him, but we can also, our minds, are lifted higher and higher. Um, God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. We cannot be holy just by being ourselves. We need time with God and allow him to do his work in us as we reflect on different things and have quiet moments with him. That is when we can experience the joy, the love, the holiness of God in our individual lives. Amen. Yes, I... I I'm reminded of Dennis, you read from Isaiah 58, called the Sabbath a day of delight. And to Dennis' observation of being holy, um, I see the word joy, the joy in the Sabbath. And that reminded me of another statement from a spirit of prophecy, that God rested at the completion of his work but she added the word joy. I'll read it to you. God rested in the joy of his completed works. I had never thought of this before. He rested at the end of his completed works. But here it says he rested in the joy of his completed works. We need to think about God's joy a whole lot more. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. He's going to rejoice over us with singing. And uh, entering into a relationship with Christ is the beginning of entering into rest. And then the day is a chance to have joy in the rest. So let's, let's uh, remember the Sabbath through the week. Some of us are tempted to uh, go put 25 hours in a day instead of 24. And uh, we come up to the Sabbath, kind of like crossing the finish line of a marathon. And uh, if I was immune from that, I'd be very happy, but I'm not. And I've been blessed to think about these things today. Thank you, panel. Thank you, uh, participants. Very good observations. Let's pray. And let's find joy in this day as we find joy in the Lord. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Jeanette if you'd have our closing prayer. Our kind, gracious Father, we're so grateful that we could come here in freedom to worship you and to study. We thank you for the thoughts that have been um, brought forth here. May we take these thoughts with us during the week to be a blessing, and may our lives be a witness of your great love and joy in creating mankind. We praise you through your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Sabbath school is finished. We will begin the church service in about eight minutes. So those that are watching online, there'll be an interlude here, and then we will begin our second service this morning here at Village. God bless you all, and thank you for joining us.